12th of December, 1594, Henry Helms, a law student at Gray's Inn, was elected Lord of Misrule for their Christmas revels. Over 60 members of Gray's Inn took part in the scripted entertainments, and he was assigned his own mock privy council and a guard for his defence. One member who contributed to the festivities was Francis Bacon, who had been elected one of the two treasurers of Gray's Inn the year before, a position that allowed him to oversee the organisation of the revels. It was at these revels that the first known performance of the Comedy of Errors took place. And as we shall see, William Shakespeare of Stratford, being an outsider, was absent. Bacon wrote the speeches for the six mock privy councillors, a point that few scholars dispute, and which both the Oxford Francis Bacon and the major works acknowledge. In November 1660, his scientific philosophy, along with the work of Galileo, was acknowledged by the mathematician John Wallis as the inspiration for the Royal Society of London. In his political life, he rose to become Solicitor General, Attorney General, Lord Chancellor, and at one point, when King James went to Scotland, he acted as temporary Regent of England. Our purpose here is to focus on the 1594 Gray's Inn Christmas Revels, an account of which has been left to us in the Gesta Graeorum, a 68-page pamphlet that was published much later in 1688. In addition to providing a detailed commentary on the revels, it gives the names of all the participants as well as a complete transcript of the speeches that were delivered. It appears to have been written shortly after the revels had ended, when events were fresh in the mind of its compiler. When the plague struck London in August 1592, town officials sealed up the doors of any house they thought was infected. Where the infectious pestilence did reign, sealed up the doors and would not let us forth. Public houses and theatres were closed, and with a fatality rate of 50 to 60 percent following infection. By the end of 1593, the disease had taken away one-tenth of London's 150,000 inhabitants. By the end of 1594, the plague had subsided to such an extent that Gray's Inn decided to proceed with their Christmas revels. On the 28th of December, 1594, Innocent's Day, the Jester Graeorum records that a comedy of errors like De Plautus his Menaikmus was played by the players. So how do we know? This was the same play that later appeared in Shakespeare's first folio of 1623. Well, plays at Oxford and Cambridge University were usually performed in Latin, whereas plays at the Inns of Court were based on translations from Roman, Italian and Greek drama. The plays Supposes and Jocasta relied on translations from Italian plays. 
the misfortunes of Arthur depended on a translation from Seneca. And the Comedy of Errors used translations from Plautus. In both the Comedy of Errors and the Revel's proceedings, we find shared terms such as juggling, sorcerer, witchcraft, wretch and conjurer. In fact, the play is set in the Greek city of Ephesus. And Acts 19 of the New Testament records how St. Paul persuaded Christian converts to burn their books on magic. Finally, in the Comedy of Errors, a gold chain is purchased from Angelo the goldsmith. This does not appear in the Plautus version, and it seems to have been added to the plot to make a technical point about the difficulties facing contemporary contract law. It's a delicately woven exposition, and it's one that would have been meaningful primarily to an audience of law students. So who performed the Comedy of Errors at Gray's Inn? Well, the idea that Shakespeare was absent seems to have first been made in 1913 by the Shakespearean scholar Edward Chichester Hart. He suggested that Shakespeare himself was perhaps not present, since he was acting on the same day before the Queen at Greenwich. The evidence for this is provided by a document in the Public Records Office, which is a warrant for payment to William Shakespeare and the Lord Chamberlain's men for their performance at court. And it was a performance on the same evening that the Comedy of Errors was being enacted at Gray's Inn. To William Kemp, William Shakespeare and Richard Burbage, servants to the Lord Chamberlain, upon the council's warrant dated at Whitehall 15th of March 1594. This means March 1595. For two several comedies or interludes showed by them before Her Majesty in Xmas time last past. Well, that's Christmas 1594. Viz upon St. Stephen's Day and Innocence Day. The important detail here is the date of Shakespeare's engagement at court, Innocence Day, which fell on the 28th of December, 1594. Unfortunately, Sir Edmund Chambers refused to believe the court warrant and instead convinced himself that the administrator had written Innocence Day by mistake so that Shakespeare was free to appear at Gray's Inn that evening. So is there any evidence at all that Shakespeare was at Gray's Inn that evening? The Gray's Inn pension book recorded all business conducted by the Gray's Inn committee. And what we see here is a transcript. Now since the members of Gray's Inn were obliged to take on the cost of any entertainments, were looking for a pension order that they should pay for a play by an outside company that had been enacted on the 28th of December 1594, Innocence Day. There are entries before that date, and then the last entry shown here, from 11th of February 1595, orders that 100 marks, which is about £67, is to be shared between the Grey's Inn players for their shows at the Queen's Court over Shrovetide. This is the reward paid by the Queen for the shows, which was distributed amongst the players. There's nothing here about asking them to foot the bill for an outside play, so let's look further. On the 8th of May 1595, the members are now ordered to contribute to the cost of the shows at court. This would cover the staging expenses incurred by Gray's Inn. Readers had to pay 10 shillings, ancient 6 shillings and 8 pence, outer barristers 5 shillings and everyone else 4 shillings. Again, there's nothing asking them to pay for the cost of a play on Innocence Day. Now we've reached the 21st of May, five months after the Comedy of Errors was played, and all we have is another reminder to the members to pay up for the court shows. There's no evidence here that an outside company was hired to either write or perform the Comedy of Errors. 
is it possible that William Shakespeare, who was still relatively unknown in 1594, managed to get his work performed unpaid in order to further his reputation? Well, the dramatist Arthur Brooke was also a non-member of the Inns of Court, and in a Temple Parliament record from the 4th of February 1562, he had to be given special admittance to have his work performed, which, as we can see, was put on record. Now, if we return to the 1594 Gray's Inn Christmas revels, Henry Helms, the mock prince, gave special admittance to seven people on the 25th of December and four more on the 6th of February. But William Shakespeare was not one of them. This suggests that his work was not used, or at the very least there is no evidence that William Shakespeare was present. So what do we know about previous performances at Gray's Inn? Were they written and performed by Gray's Inn members? Or were they provided by a professional company? In the 50 years leading up to the 1594 revels, Four are known to have been written by Gray's Inn members, and these are shown in red, and three acted by them, and these are shown in green. None are known to have been written or performed by an outsider. Only Lincoln's Inn from 1564 to 80 are known to have employed an outside playing company. So precedent does not favour a professional company being hired for festivities at Gray's Inn. Gray's Inn's policy on expenditure during the revels is clearly set out in the Gesta Graorum. In the bottom three lines we can see that the whole affair was intended to be for the credit of Gray's Inn and rather to be performed by witty inventions than chargeable expenses. In other words, they intended to write and perform their own material. It turns out that all the identifiable contributors of the Revels were Gray's Inn members. Francis Bacon for the six Privy Councillor's speeches, Thomas Campion, who composed a hymn for the Shrovetide Mask, and Francis Davison, who wrote a sonnet which was performed before the hymn. So all the evidence suggests that William Shakespeare neither wrote nor performed the Comedy of Errors for Gray's Inn. Nevertheless, in 1598, Francis Mears decided to attribute the play to Shakespeare. In reference to comedy and tragedy, he writes, So Shakespeare, among E. English, is the most excellent in both kinds for the stage. For comedy, witness his errors. Six years later, William Honing, secretary to the Master of the Revels, listed Shaxbird under the heading The Poets Which Made the Plays for a play of errors, played at court on Innocence Night 1604, exactly ten years after the Gray's Inn performance. Well, my best guess from the evidence is this. Shakespeare acquired it sometime after the Revels and before Mears referred to it in 1598. Presumably he paid a fair price for it, and having acquired it he felt entitled to put his name on it and claim the credit. So what role did Francis Bacon play in all this? We know that he wrote the six Privy Councillor speeches at the Revels. But is there any evidence that he contributed to a real play?
In 2013, during research at Brunel University, I developed the method of rare collocation profiling. The Early English Books Online database contains over 60,000 searchable texts before 1700. So I can take a phrase from a play like the Comedy of Errors, search the database and obtain an estimate of its rarity. So now let's look at the rare phrase analysis of the Comedy of Errors. Francis Bacon's matches are shown here to the left and top right while Thomas Hayward's are bottom right. Apart from number two in the top right table all Bacon's matches are later than the Grey's Inn Revels. So the most that can be claimed from this evidence is that he borrowed from the play. In the bottom right table, Thomas Hayward's matches are all after the Gray's Inn revels, and since he was not known to have been a member of Gray's Inn, the evidence would support him as a later reviser. The only other significant returns are for Thomas Nash, who had three before the revels and one after. So Bacon and Hayward are really the only ones who register a significant number of rare parallels. So the Comedy of Errors came out of the Inns of Court from which William Shakespeare was excluded, both as a writer and a performer. Yet it later appeared on official records under Shakespeare's name. So in conclusion, I leave you with a question. If Shakespeare could put his name on one play that was not his, how many more received this treatment?